Good morning, everyone. We are reading in Book One, the Book of Beginnings, Canto Three, the Yoga of the Soul's Release. These are the experiences of King Asvapati. And we, uh, we have read to the end of the canto, and then we, um, we started looking in more detail, I think at the, the break on page 38. And how far did we get? Can somebody tell me? Yes, the indeterminable line that carries the everlasting through the years. That's where we stopped and we should continue from there. These are experiences that Asvapati is having, knowledge that is coming to him. Do you want to have the speaker louder? Is it? So now it's stopped. So everybody can hear? Yes. Uh, we are starting to read now on page 40 at line 646, the magician order of the cosmic mind. Has everybody got the place? Uh, Franz, you'd like to read? The magician order of the cosmic mind coercing the freedom of infinity is a stark array of nature single effects and life's incessant signals of event, transmuted chance, occurrences in the nose, the chaos of science into illuminations. <coughs> Out of the rich wonders and the intricate forms of the spirits dance with matter as its must, the balance of the world's design will clear, its symmetry of self-arranged effects, managed in the deep perspectives of the soul and the realism of its elusive art, its logic of infinite intelligence, its magic of a changing eternity. Thank you. This first sentence which um, Franz read seems really very mysterious. And uh, when we read it in the Thursday class last week, um, I was asked, why does this word coercing come in here? Uh, it was Mori who asked that question. So it's nice that he's come now because apparently by chance um, I came across in the Life Divine a sentence, a paragraph by Sri Aurobindo where he explains that in any manifestation all the principles have to be there. Supermind, mind, life, matter. One or other may be more predominant on one plane or another, but they are all there. And that the function of the mind is actually to create a universe by discriminating and arranging. It uh, takes this absolute freedom that happens in the transcendent state, in infinity and eternity, and arranges it into a universe. That's exactly what he says here, no? The magician order of the cosmic mind it's not any individual mind. It's the universal mind. 
the principle of mind operating on the universal level, coercing the freedom of infinity with the stark array of nature's symbol facts. That's how it arranges it into all these symbolic appearances that we see in the material universe. And also life's incessant signals of event. Life is moving in time and space and things are happening. All that is part of the order. And another thing that the mind, the cosmic mind does is to transmute, to change, to transform chance recurrences, things that happen once and again and maybe again and again, they get uh, established into habits which we call the laws of nature. In this way, cosmic mind organizes that chaos of signs that's there in the freedom of the transcendent gets organized into a universe. That was very illuminating for me. I don't know whether it makes sense to anybody else. <laughs> I, I thought, oh, that's exactly explaining these lines. And then, of course, the next uh, sentence is that having seen that, how all that is organized, then Aswapati sees that um, what is happening in this material universe is actually a dance, a dance of spirit. And in this dance, a spirit has put on this mask, this disguise of matter for its appearances. So he sees all those whirls and the rich wonders of the spirit's dance, of its movement with matter as its mask. To Aswapati, he begins to see clearly the balance of the world's design, that there is a symmetry, a harmony and a balance no? of these effects that have been self-arranged by spirit. No? They've been managed in the deep perspectives of the soul. Perspective is a tool that artists use to give the, uh, the perception of depth on a flat surface. No? So in the soul, all these effects of nature are beautifully balanced and harmonized in the deep perspectives of the soul. And he sees that uh, the spirit's dance is, has art, it is an artful expression. That art is elusive, but at the same time, it is realism. These are usually different kinds of art, but the realism and the illusoriness are combined in the art of the spirit's dance. He sees in the movement of the universe its logic of infinite intelligence, its magic of a changing eternity. If we think of the transcendent state, we may think of it as unchanging, permanent. And in a sense, it is like that, but it carries within it the possibility of infinite change. Jocelyn, would you read?
Thank you. With the help of the goddess of inspiration, King Asvapati catches a glimpse of things that are forever unknown, that are in a sense unknowable, at least unknowable to the mind. And he gives a list of some of those things. First, the letters stood out of the unmoving word. To me, this suggests that he sees the, um, the three syllables, the three components of the Supreme Word, the Om. It has three syllables that together make up this word. Later on in uh, Canto 4, we shall read something about the significance of those, uh, those syllables. Here he just gets a glimpse of the ah, uh, the oo, the mm. He gets a glimpse of the immutable, the unchanging, unchangeable origin, which has no name. And he sees emerging from it, as if from immensely deep seas, a trail of ideas with a capital I, real ideas that will be realized in the manifestation or that have been realized in the manifestation. These are the ideas that made the world. And he also sees a seed, a seed of the spirit's blind and huge desire. That seed has been sown in the black earth of nature's trance. The color black suggests the inconscience, the inconscience perhaps of matter, of the earth principle, which is a kind of trance, a deep, indrawn consciousness, so far indrawn that we feel there's no consciousness there at all. But that seed of the spirit's blind and huge desire planted in this black earth. Black earth is also the most fertile kind of earth, isn't it? Things grow wonderfully well from the black earth. So the tree of cosmos, the universe envisioned as a vast tree, has grown out of nature's trance and has spread its magic arms through a dream of space. To his vision also, immense realities took on a shape. Sri Aurobindo is going to list some of these. They are realities, huge truths. They took on forms, symbolic forms, which he could see. So the first one that's mentioned is the bodiless namelessness that saw God born. It's as if that has that bodiless, it has no body, it has no name, no form, but it's an immense reality. And it's as if Aswapati sees it uh, peering out, looking out from the shadow of the unknown, this, this reality, which was there before what we think of as God was formed, was realized. And that bodiless namelessness that was there before the beginning of the manifestation, he saw that it's trying to gain from the mortal's mind and soul a deathless body and a divine name. We might think that this is the justification for the existence of this universe and this whole process of evolution, that that 
bodiless namelessness has plunged itself into the trance of matter in order to evolve out of that an immortal body, a deathless body, and a form that can carry a divine name. Maybe that is the fulfillment of the whole evolutionary process. And then he sees the architect who builds in trance, who has envisioned the plans for this manifestation. He is also, he's building in trance. So what Asvapati sees is a face with immobile lips, vast, super real wings, and that visage is in a state of deep, super conscient sleep. The eyes with their closed lids, but behind those closed lids, in that super conscious sleep, in that trance, he is seeing all things, everything that has to be realized in the material universe. And he also gets a glimpse of the original desire, the wish, born in the void, in the emptiness. This peers out too. He saw the hope that never sleeps, that's running after the fulfillment of that desire. The fleet, the feet that run behind a fleeting fate. Fate is always running ahead. The ineffable meaning of the endless dream. Ineffable, that can't be put into words, which can't be expressed in speech. Earlier we read about the spirit's blind and huge desire, you know, which has given uh, rise to this universe. Now he sees the desire itself, the hope, the urge, everything that keeps all this endless dream going on towards realization. Shall we go on? Loretta, would you like to read? Thank you. At this stage, Asvapati is only getting glimpses of these immense realities. Further on in the poem, several of them will be developed, perhaps all of them, in much more detail. But now we, along with King Asvapati, we just get a first glimpse of these high realities. And here in the first sentence which Loretta read, we get the first mention of supermind, the radiant world of the everlasting truth. He sees it hardly for a moment, just a small glimpse. The mind can't see that reality. He sees it uh, something like a torch, a, a burning light that's held up by some power of God. He sees it glimmering very faintly, like a faint star bordering the night, above the horizon, no? above the golden overmind's shimmering ridge. For a very, very long time in the evolution of the universe, it seems, according to what Shrobindo tells us, that the overmind has been the, the home of the gods. Divine powers 
have been working from there. No. So that is like the, the highest level there has been. And now Sri Aurobindo has come and told us that beyond that there is supermind. And we might imagine it um, just a step up. But here he says it was seen like a faint star. It's so far away, so far above the shimmering ridge of the overmind. But that's the, the home of the radiant world of the everlasting truth. And then he seems to get a glimpse, his first glimpse of the Supreme Mother, even were caught as through a cunning veil, the smile of love that sanctions the long game, that says yes to everything that is going on in the universe. The calm indulgence and maternal breasts of wisdom suckling the child laughter of chance. This is the indulgent mother nourishing what seems to be chance through which the evolution is proceeding. She also embodies silence, the nurse of the Almighty's power, the omniscient hush, a silence containing all knowledge, which is the womb from which the immortal word of creation has been born, a still brooding face of the timeless, the creative eye of eternity. <laughs> yes, chance is the unexpected element in our life and experience. On one side there's fate, there's necessity, there's what is fixed and determined. But on the other hand, there's also always uh, this laughter of the eternal child who's completely free and who can always bring in something unexpected. Mother describes him like a child, or the child aspect of the Lord, enjoying freely. <laughs> That's why nothing can ever be fully predicted. He may always step in with some little joke. The Rishis, the Vedic Rishis, saw this star, yes? They saw that, they saw and they envisioned that radiant world of everlasting truth, yes. And it's, it's because of inspiration, that other love, that, that power that comes and gives us this. Gives us what? Gives us the view, the mm. Yes, it is the action mm -hmm. of the goddess of inspiration who reveals that yes. to him. Yes. So I, I find this a, a really amazing um, passage. It runs from line 10631 to where we just stopped now, 695. It's 34 lines. Mm. 631. Above the reasons, brilliant slender curve to 695, the creative eye of eternity, 64 lines. And now we seem to move on to another stage. Yes. Yes. But here he speaks about the golden overmind. Yes. Sorry, I can't help there. <laughs> We talk about the golden lid, yes. Mm -hmm. hmm. Sorry? Supermind we conceive of as the sun 
Overmind is often symbolized by the moon. So the full moon is sometimes golden, but it's a reflected light. I don't know whether that helps. Um, there is a, a gradation of consciousness, of course, from matter to the very borderline of manifestation. And on Mother's map, she has so shown them in levels of lights bordering each other. But what is interesting here is that Sri Aurobindo apparently deliberately indicates a huge distance. And when Mother prepared that map for Huta, what comes above overmind is not uh, supermind. It is the world of Ananda and then the world of uh, Tapas and Chit and Sat. And she said, that's the borderline. And uh, there she pictured a golden figure, the archetypal individual figure. She spoke about that a lot. And she said, because we have come ourselves from that transcendent origin, it is possible for an individual to climb up this ladder of worlds and pass over the borderline into that transcendent realm where there's no time and no space and no separation, no division. Hmm? And she said, usually when it happens that a very developed being makes that transition, they perceive that timeless, infinite, eternal world as empty. Because it's empty of anything that our mind or our senses can grasp. But she said it's not really empty. It's packed full of possibilities, infinite possibility. And she told Huta, she said, that is what Sri Aurobindo has done. He has gone beyond that borderline and he seized one of those possibilities, supermind, and he's brought it down to the earth. That's the only light I can cast, whether we can understand it or not. So that's why Supermind wasn't there in her, her um, ladder. Of the class you said also that you read in Life Divine how it's uh, the Supermind where everything is influenced in all parts, and that it has all uh, a connection uh, together. Through the Overmind. Mm -hmm. It has always been done through the Overmind. Mm -hmm. The world of the gods. And that in Mother's map is shown all the others are a color, deep blue for the inconscient, bright uh, manoha, red for the physical, and violet for the vital, and different shades of blue, and then a shade of yellow for different levels of the mind, and then comes over mind, and that is uh, tiny, tiny dots of all possible colors. Anyway, that's a digression. Let's go back to the text. If, if somebody will remind me, I'll bring it next week. Hmm? Yes, somebody, if somebody will remind me, I'll bring it next week and we can have a look at it. Hmm. some possibility or potentiality that was there in the infinite and eternal, which hadn't yet entered into the manifestation. And now what he has done, he has brought it into the manifestation. So it's actually working here, this new principle, which wasn't active before. Now it is, more, now it is and he, even he, when he became aware of it, he said, it's, uh, it's something destined, it's certain that it must come. Mm -hmm. Perhaps there are many, many more things, no? Mm -hmm. There are potentialities in the infinite and eternal. In fact, in fact surely there are, which uh, 
haven't yet become part of this manifestation. <laughs> the world of the truth. He chose the world of the truth, perhaps I can say this, because his work is to hasten the reign of the divine love upon earth. And the love can't come until the truth has been established. But the, the divine love, the rule of the divine love upon earth, that's what Mother has categorized this as Sri Aurobindo's work. She says, I've stayed here to continue Sri Aurobindo's work, which is by serving the truth and enlightening mankind to hasten the reign of the divine's love upon earth. The truth brings a certain purification that's necessary before divine uh, love can become supreme. Would you read next? Yeah. Line 696. Thank you. Before the inspiring goddess had been just coming often <laughs> to uh, King Aswapati, oft inspiration with her lightning foot feet traversed the soundless corridors of his mind. So all this is a result of her visits. These are some of the things she has brought him. But now she enters into him, entered a mortal's breast, and she made there her study, her place where she's going to study things and find out new secrets hmm, of divining thought. It means thought that's guided by intuition, not by reason. Hmm. And her sanctuary of prophetic speech where she sat upon the tripod seat of mind. A tripod is something that has three legs. And uh, the ancient Greeks, they used to place their offerings upon a tripod for it to go to the gods. Also, the priestess, the priestess of Apollo at Delphi, when she was asked questions. She would sit on the tripod seat to go into trance and give her oracles. Here he speaks of the tripod seat of mind. This suggests this lower triplicity of matter, life, mind. These are joined together and uh, she has entered a human being. There she's making this lower triplicity her tripod seat. Yes. And uh, Shobindo gives a, a, a full description yes. of these three things in the record of yoga. Yes. In the sun, Shatushaya, Shatushaya. Yes. And he said, um, I read it in French, the Jnana Sota, 
has three power, the first is Trishti, which is for revelation of Swayam Akasha, second is Shruti, inspiration, and third is Priti, who has two parts, which is one is intuition, and second is Viveka, which is uh, discrimination. discrimination. And then mm. give a full description of all, of all these. Uh, yes, this is in the record of yoga. Yeah. First, yeah. Uh, and what is, the, what is the significance of this fl fire from below? For me, it's a supermind line. That's involved in matter. And, yeah. and the pity, just taking some uh, the smoke, yeah. smoke of it. No, yes. Giving, uh, yes, for fragmentary revelations. Yes, thank you, Claude. So as a result of her coming, everything widens below, above, sorry, <laughs> the upper levels of consciousness widen out and the lower levels are lit up, all lit below. She even digs wells of light. That's light coming from below, isn't it? <laughs> she digs in the darkness and releases the hidden light. And on those undiscovered depths of the subconscious, the unconscious, she imposed a form, she can reveal the form there. And she lent a vibrant cry to the unuttered vasts. There are all these vast realms of existence which have no means of self-expression but she can uh, divine their meaning, their aspiration, their longing, their wishes, and give a voice to that, to communicate to Aswapati. And she also goes upwards. It says she, drew, view, she joined the heights and the depths. No? So from these great, shoreless, voiceless, starless breaths far above she brought down to Aswapati on earth fragments of revealing thought that have been hewn, that have been cut out of that dense silence of the ineffable, the inexpressible. Uh, Manoha? Dream of seeking thought, wandering through space, entered the invisible and forbidden heart. The treasure was found on the supernal day. In the deep subconscious, clothed as children, lifted it showed the riches of the cave, where, by the nicer traffickers of sense, unused, guarded beneath nice dragon clothes, in folds of velvet darkness draped they sleep, whose priceless value could have saved the world. The darkness carrying morning in its breast looked from the, for the eternal wise returning dream, the advent of a larger day and rescue of the lost heads of the sun. We'll pause there. Larry, you would have anything to comment on this first sentence? A voice in the heart. Only that uh, inspiration had entered much in the heart. Hmm. So she's the one who speaks the unuttered name. Mm -hmm. And then something happens. A dream of seeking thought, wandering through space, entered the invisible and forbidden house, a place that's been closed and secret until now. And there he finds the treasure of a supernal day. Sorry? I don't think I've ever explained this sentence and I don't know how to explain it now. Sorry? Yeah, well, supernal means high, super conscious, supreme. This could be a reference to superman. I don't know. Perhaps somebody who really studies record of yoga can find a, a reference that illuminates this. Yeah. What is the forbidden house? What indeed? 
But what she does next is very clear. She goes into the deep subconscious, and there she lifts up her lovely lamp, and that reveals all the things that are hidden there, the riches of the cave. This is an allusion to another Vedic legend. We could say it is a parallel legend to the legend of Satyavan and Savitri. It is the, the legend of the lost herds of the sun, the cows, the, the rays of illumination, uh, but also the cows that have been stolen from the sun god. They've been stolen by the Panis and the Dasyus in the Vedas. Here Sri Aurobindo calls them the miser traffickers of sense. They are the, the senses that do bargaining. They are kind of robbers. Instead of uh, offering all these riches to the Supreme, they take them for themselves. And of course, this story of the robber's cave has come down to us in uh, fairy tales uh, from the Arabian Nights, no? Uh, it's very nice to think that those stories have a Vedic origin. The, these lost herds of the sun, they also, the sun hidden in a cave, uh, this appears in Greek mythology. There it is the mind, Hermes, who has stolen them and taken them by their tails and drag them backwards into the cave so that uh, the feet show going the other way. They couldn't be found. No? And um, in Japanese mythology also, there's a story about the sun hiding herself in a cave and uh, how they have to, uh, everybody has to gather around and sing and dance and uh, so that she's curious and looks out. And then they show her a mirror and she can see how beautiful she is. And then she comes out. So these are in symbolic, beautiful symbolic stories. No? So here Sri Aurobindo is uh, saying that the riches, all the riches of potential, all the divine powers of God that are potential here in our universe, they are hidden. They're hidden in the subconscious. Yes. 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 The Sometimes they are stolen by Sisyphus against Sisyphus. Yes. Sisyphus is the intellect, and Hermes is the intellect of the mind. Yes. So there's two different stories. We must understand that as when we mix up in ourselves, what the what the light are coming from? Yes. From the intellect of Sisyphus, from the Life of, of, of yes, life. yeah, thanks. Yeah. So in the Vedas, what happens is that um, the rishis know that those riches must be hidden somewhere, and they ask for help. And it is the goddess Sarama, the goddess of intuition, who, like a questing hound, we, we read about her last week, uh, she sniffs out where they are, and she leads the rishis to the cave. But that cave is in a dark black hill. It's really difficult to open. And they have to appeal to the gods. They appeal to Lord Indra, the king of the gods, the lord of mind. And he utters a very powerful mantra, a very loud cry, which shatters the hill. And then the, the cows of light can come out. And when they come out, then also the rain comes. All the divine grace and power and everything comes down and flows in, uh, into seven rivers. So um, here there's an allusion to that, the riches of the cave, everything that's hidden in our subconscious. It's been put there by the miser traffickers of sense these primitive parts of ourselves which hold on to things. They're unused. They're guarded by a dragon. That's what dragons do. They gather treasures in caves and then they sit on them. 
They don't allow anybody to use them. Hmm? That's what dragons do. So in the Vedas, it speaks about this dragon at the dark foundation of things that is guarding all these treasures which have to be rescued. No? They are lying there in folds of velvet darkness. Their priceless value could have saved the world, but there they are, the dragons sitting on them. But when she does that, when uh, inspiration holds up her jewel lamp, then that darkness that's there in the cave, it's actually carrying within it the possibility of morning, of dawn. In fact, all night is carrying within it a dawn to be born. No? So a darkness carrying morning in its breast looked for the eternal, wide, returning gleam of dawn, no? waiting the advent of a larger ray. It's waiting for a greater light to come to rescue the lost herds of the sun. That larger ray would, I suppose, be supermind. And Sri continues about these, uh, these riches. I think we'll read that sentence too, uh, Claude. I beg your pardon? Yes, yes, of course. These, uh, have you got the lines there? Yeah. So it enters into the human body. Yeah. And it is hidden within the cave. Yes. So it is these uh, traffickers and the dust users, their purpose is to hide the light. Yes. For the intuition, the dust will bring the light from the cave. Yes. So similar mm. to that. Yes. Thank you. So this is that uh, basic Vedic truth. A uh, legend which expresses so many deep truths, which Sri Aurobindo recovered in his study of the Vedas. Yeah. The body, the hmm. human body. The human body. Everything happens inside the human body. Which is a symbol of the body of the earth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, yes. Let's stop there. Yeah. This is another way of speaking about these treasures. Hmm? So there are great secrets, riches, which have been dropped carelessly as evolution went on. Care creation, spendthrift work. Spendthrift, what would you say that spendthrift means, Paula? Exactly, yes. So. <laughs> so they don't care about saving things and being careful about things. They're extravagant. So creation was like that. didn't matter if some things were lost on the way. They've been left in the shantiers, in the construction sites of the bottomless world. And uh, they've been stolen. Those clever robbers, they had to look out for them and they have stolen them those robbers of the deep. They're the same ones, the, the Panis and the Dasyus. These are the golden shekels, these immensely precious uh, coins of the eternal lie. And they're hidden, hoarded from touch and view. And we can't even think about them and desire them. We don't even know that they are there. You know, locked in blind anters. It's an, another word for a cave of the ignorant flood, that deep ocean of the inconscient. On purpose they are there, lest men should find them. If we would find them, we would be like gods. We'll stop there for today. Mm -hmm.
we can listen to Mother reading some of these lines. Let's 